So good morning all and welcome to the fourth session. I said, wow, it's been a fast four weeks. It's gone by hopefully as fast for you as it has for us putting this together. Um, we've had over 180 people registered for each of the first three sessions. I see we have 70 here in the morning session today. Uh, we did anticipate a little less just because we were focusing on some of the coordinators for local working group sessions in this session. So um, thanks for your participation. We look forward to the discussion today and all that you have to offer. Um, so next slide, Lisa. So again, this uh, conservation locally led two series is brought to you by all of those of us on the screen here, you can see. Next slide. And the purpose and the goals, I'm not gonna read this, but if you've been with us before, you've seen this, hopefully it's ingrained into you why we're doing this, um, but I'm gonna cover that a little bit more as well. And so I know some of you asked why and why now? And so just a little background on that in this fourth and closing session, but we've had a lot of change in turnover. Uh, it's been three years since we did the last session of this locally led training where I was the traveling roadshow out to your um, areas for some face-to-face. -face. So a lot of things have changed, obviously. Um, some of it from our end are changes in resource concerns, the staff. We have a lot of participants in this series that are new to uh, local working groups in the local ed process. Uh, our processes have changed, our programs have changed. And then also I think our state level vision of what locally led, especially from the NRCS side has really changed. Uh, you heard from Troy Daniel, state conservationist in session one, and really what his vision is for locally led and how he's put more of an emphasis on that local involvement and directing and steering all things that we do. Um, so we also know there was some dissatisfaction with you know local work group process, not understanding why we're doing it or finding the value uh, or the impacts in it. So that's really what we tried to focus on in this training and we are gonna continue on today. Um, so. You know, there isn't one magic way that we can just say everyone should do this template. Here's how it's going to be best for your local work group. You know, some of you have a lot of experience that can share your wisdom. Um, others are new and have great ideas and fresh ideas to make this beneficial. So I think by getting us all together, offering up a variety of opportunities, topics, ideas, hopefully you can take these back and help shape your locally led and local working group efforts to make them um, more successful. So the next slide, Lisa. So today then we're really gonna focus on making local working groups customized. You know, ideas from the training series to make it even better, things that you can do to tailor the, the needs of your local stakeholders, uh, resource concerns, ways to better customize the involvement and make it more engaging process. So that's a, the purpose of today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Leanne Buck for some opening comments as well. Leanne? Sure, thank you, Keith. Um, again, I just wanna say welcome to everybody. And again, my name is Leanne Buck with the Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And what I'm also thinking about is, you know, we've just kind of come out upon the anniversary of following a year of working through a pandemic. And we all know there's gonna be a new normal of how we communicate and interact. And this session is gonna focus on how we think about customizing. And for me, we also call this locally led. So it's not only about your local working group process, but I also think about it, it the, some of the tidbits that we're gonna learn and the information and the tools will make us think about how we interact with our partners or for some water districts with your own local citizen board members. So again, I also like to think of it as what, what is old is new again. And as we think about enhancing our processes to engage citizens and partners with our important work, um, what never changes is the trust factor. And to quote uh, the association, a keynote speaker back in December, his name was David Horsager. And one of his things is he talked about the pillars of trust. And what I wanna think about again, as we continue to build upon our skill sets is, Trust will help us increase the effectiveness of our teams. That's what he's saying. That's what a lot of leaders are saying. And that's what you lead by example. So again, I want to think about it in terms of how we build and maintain trust in a new virtual setting is going to be a never ending endeavor. So I want to say today, we're going to continue to build upon. It's not like we're starting from zero, but again, we're building upon your excellent work, your current work of garnering par partner and public input while working in a world of ever increasing virtual formats. So again, welcome, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful instructors, Lisa Hines and Donna Ray Shepherd. And uh, welcome again and thank you and take it away. 
Great, thank you, Keith and Leanne. So you can see we've got another content piece coming today, diversifying participation. And that's first up on our agenda today. And then we're gonna do more of a recap or a synthesis about all the ideas or many of them that have come forth about hosting an effective local work group meeting. And then we have a partnership piece about better together. And then as have been um, favorites of the time, we have breakout groups. So today our key activity we're asking our speakers to respond to is what's something favorite for them of spring? And those of you who were in a bit early saw we also had the Mentimeter. So Keith, can you tell us something that's a favorite of yours from spring? Yeah, I sure can, Donna Ray. My, my favorite is, is getting back outside after being cooped up all winter or cooped up part of the winter. I'm um, getting out, you know, leaves, you know, flowers blooming, the geese honking, all those things that, that make spring spring in Minnesota. I love the change of seasons. Great. Thank you, Keith. I think to the um, go to Leanne, what's one of your favorite things about spring? For me, I think about it in terms of tulips. And I also have a wonderful memory of a cabin up at Alexandria and Lily of the Valley starting to bloom. So spring to me means flowers. And Great. Color. Thank you. And I could say ditto to both of those, but I'll say when the birds come back and you start to hear your mornings with the birds. So um, we're asking, we have a notes page with your pre-packet. And so if you want to note those and note your own. So excellent. We are going to um, move into our first session, which is with Molly Bowler from NRCS. She's your public affairs specialist. And Molly, what's one of your favorite things about spring? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up, anybody? Yes. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, my favorite thing about spring are the mud pies, getting those kids outside and wearing them out. So they're having a great time and then they sleep really well. Diversifying. Participation with effective recruiting. Boy, is that a mouthful. I'm gonna boil it down for you. What this really means is, how do we get to see some other people? We've been seeing the same folks for a while, probably in our county offices and, and at our meetings, it's time to see some other folks. So our, our favorite former US Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. He could have said, all conservation is local. I, I know working with NRCS, it often feels like things come from the top down. Like we get something from the headquarters from Washington DC and, and we have to deal with it locally. Instead of thinking that we have to deal with it locally, let's just think that it's all local. Everything is local. So how can we get more diversity at our meetings? Our local community might just be more varied than you think. Uh, and I started looking into how do I figure out who is in our community? And I, I had to think that it was kind of like figuring out who you can date in your community. And, and I thought, you know, if you were going to date, you might go to Farmers Only or um, Match.com or Plenty of Fish. So also, if you're trying to date new people or court new people to come to your meetings, you'd want to go to NAS, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Now, if you go into NAS, you'll find that they say in Minnesota, we have uh, farms with Asian producers at about 336. That's $64 million worth of products. Uh, farms with Hispanic producers, we have about 583. That's $211 million worth of products. That's, uh, I don't know about you, but $211 million seems pretty big to me. But are we sure we really want to believe in NAS? Are we sure you don't want to go over to a match.com or farmers only? Pretty sure we do. When you're dating online, you want to go with a known online dating source. And if you're looking for farmers data, you want to go with a non or with a, a known source. Did I say non? Sorry, after lunch, a known source. So NAS was formed in 1863. They've been around a long time collecting information from farmers for farmers. I love this picture. Notice those hats. There's a hat there on the hat hook. There's a hat up on top of the, the bookcase. Notice these are all middle-aged old white guys. That's kind of what we're hoping to avoid now. It's time that we broaden out. 
Uh, I did think about comparing NAS to a dating site. And uh, although we didn't have dating online in 1863, there was plenty of mail or of rides in the 1860s. I looked into this this morning, talked to a, a friend of mine who's a historian, and he said it was quite common for men to put ads out in the 1860s uh, seeking domestic help, quote unquote domestic help, uh, but women weren't allowed to do so unless they were prostitutes. Um, let's not be prostitutes. I'm not even gonna go there anymore. So what does the online profile look like? Kind of like your own profile, if you're dating online. I'm not, by the way, dating online, but I interviewed all my friends who might be dating online or who were before COVID hit, and they all had a profile set up. And that's just the same as our county profile set up from NAS. Here's what uh, the Blue Earth County profile looks like. It says here that we have about 1,500 producers. 400 or so of them are females. That surprised me a little bit. The thing that really surprised me is that new and beginning farmers, 336 of 1,500, 300 are new and beginning. I did not expect that. This is why we need to go in and look at these profiles. So I hope I have your attention now. You're thinking, really? This is information is out there available for my county too? What? Where is that? Here is how you can find that data. And I put this in here because last week I found it. And then I went back in this week to look again and I, I couldn't find it. I, it took me an hour to figure it all out. And I figured I'm not making you guys dig like that. I'm just gonna make it easy for you. So here you go. You go into NAS, follow that little link, see where it says state and county profiles, click on Minnesota. Seems pretty obvious, right? Maybe you wanna date outside Minnesota have at it, but when you're going for your county, you want to be local and keep it within your own county and your own state, okay? Then select state and county under county profiles. Don't go one up under state and county reports. We don't want the report, we want the profile. Keep going, keep going, bingo, now you're there. I looked at Polk County just to get a little further out than I was at Blue Earth. Polk County, here's what the first page looks like. And then I went to the bottom of page two. And this is the information that I found really interesting. About 2,000 producers, 500 of which are females. Go ladies, women, females. 15 of the 2,000 are Asian. Didn't know that, didn't really expect it. Really didn't expect to see a native Hawaiian Pacific Islander producer up there. We need to invite that person to our meetings, right? They will bring great coffee if you haven't had Kona coffee. But the thing that really got my attention is this 76 people have internet access. Now, this data is from 2017. I have to wonder if that 76 is accurate, I don't know. I didn't call anybody in Polk County to see. Uh, but if we're trying to get people's attention, if we're trying to date, essentially, online dating is not gonna be the way to go in Polk County. So now we know who's out there. We need to figure out how are we gonna get a hold of them? So we need to go through the media, probably not the internet, maybe the television, Always the radio is a great, great place to go. The newspaper, again, we're back to doing that, uh, that personal ad. Um, I was thinking about how we would write a personal ad. I'm gonna let you do your own personal ad for your own uh, local work group meeting. So now you've thought about your media, how are we gonna contact these folks? You need to phone a friend. Here's our recruitment tips. Number one, identify the representation missing in your county, in your meeting. You've already done that, you've already gone to NAS, way to go. Number two, write a statement on who you are looking for, why you need their representation and what's in it for them. Essentially, you have to answer, so what? Why do they care? And yes, this is me on the phone, this is in our new office. I have lots of quarters available to me so I can call you. Uh, you can call me though, it's free to me, so I recommend you call me. Uh, it's a very, it's an open air office. Mm 
we're going to keep going to our next slide, which is now you found these folks. How are we going to be engaging, inviting, and incorporating our new members of our new community? You need to find these community leaders, right, of the underrepresented community members and use some non traditional networking. We looked at that media slide before, but now there's a foreign language press. Let's go to some different places of worship some organizational newsletters. I write a newsletter every month. I know I'm never turning down anybody who wants to put anything in my newsletter. And I know that your local newsletters are the same way. And some farmers market merchants. Uh, I've heard from some DCs who actually went around in the farmer's market and invited those farmers and they got some response. So that, that was really cool. Now here's something really important. Number six, keep inviting your new recruits to come back. Uh, it takes the average person five dates before they feel like they're in a relationship. You need to be dating these new folks to come in to your meeting. So you need to invite them at least five times and keep inviting our new members to come back. Let's summarize the summary. It's a spring and summary summary. Diversity is good your meeting will be enhanced by it. Find out who is in your community. Look at NAS. Reach all aspects of your community. Try some different media, some different outlets, something besides what you've always done. And then most important, keep inviting you new recruits. Keep asking them back on dates or they're not gonna consider themselves in a relationship with you. I know we don't have time for you all to respond to us right now, of what does your board look like? But I welcome you to put it in the chat or to email it to me and I'll share it in our newsletter. Again, I'm always looking for stuff for our newsletter. What does your board look like? Who comes to your local work group meetings? Who else can you invite? And have you been successful in expanding your groups or are you seeing the same folks that you've been seeing for years and years? If you're dating the same folks for years and years, it's time to shake it up, folks. Time to go on that dating online site Go out to farmers.gov or in this case, NAS, and find out who you're missing. What do you need to know from me? That's, that's what I have for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. We do want to um, remind folks that in our earlier session, Anita Provazino talked about the, um, all the various stakeholders that you um, can engage with. And so that's just a, just a reminder. So next slide. And you recall how Anita talked about if um, you wanna bring color into your local work group, make sure you spend adequate time um, and use some of these tips that Molly gave you. So thank you so much. So we are moving into our second section called hosting an effective local work group meeting online. And for that, we are starting with a poll for each of you um, and just want to have a sense of how much you've hosted online meetings and then have you did you host online last year or maybe you've had a blizzard and had to move to your local work group online so the poll is launched go ahead and respond to those questions and we're kind of a pause point so i'm going to end the polling and share the results there you go donna ray so looks oh. like um like it was for me, I had occasional online meeting hosting. Um, about a third of you have not. And so it, it is a creative opportunity. And, and then some of you um, do have that hosting it from the local work group. So we certainly encourage um, conversation and sharing about how to do that. So our next section here is about how to um, do an online meeting, especially for those who have not and jump in on um, other ideas for those of you who had. So this is coming full circle and we will send this out in a handout, but this is across the four series. What are the stages? So the first stage really is now SWCD and the NRCS leads um, ought to get together to do pre-work. And that pre-work includes a variety of these tasks and most of them are outlined in your NRCS guidance. 
And then as part of that, you will set up a, a meeting. It might be a standalone. It might be something where you're recognizing your conservation family of the year. But at that meeting, you'll have at least three goals, identifying those natural resource concerns, proposing program changes, and then getting input on technical and non-programmatic recommendations. So um, with just a reminder of what that resource concern handout looks like, it went out and after session one, and it's going, it um, was in your packet again this time. So next um, slide, Lisa, or not slide, but there we go. So just a reminder as part of your pre-work that you're invited to customize those resource categories uh, because for example, aquatic habitat probably doesn't apply to your homestead unless you put a pond in um, and have fish in it, it probably doesn't apply. So we're gonna talk about that. Next slide. And there's your tip sheet where you are looking at the various categories. And so in that pre-work, you will collapse some of those categories in order to only bring in to your local work group meeting the resource concerns that are relevant for the, for the type of land use. Okay, next slide. And then uh, you might recall we had um, Nate Hilla earlier and he talked about ways to get Farm Bill program input and he used the metaphor of buckets. However, we are going to pause today in our training to look at how you might use Jamboard to have people make their comments for um, the proposed program changes and technical and non-programmatic. Then once you're done with your external work, it's back to the office and there is a record that is kept about, about the questions and so on. And from that, you have a local application, which is you see Darren, who was in session two, how he incorporated those natural resource concerns into his watershed district and also for his district. So you use that data locally. And then in addition, uh, it goes to the state office and that is where Keith, and Troy Daniel and your state technical advisory committee summarizes it to prioritize resource concerns. Now you might be saying, hmm, I'm looking at spring. I love all that spring stuff. What, what's the time frame for this? Again, coming full circle. So the time frame for hosting and getting your goals met through local work group first is by July 30th. So you got a little bit of a summertime there. And then the record that goes up to um, NRCS is by August 6th. So we are in the shoulder season for that. So the next portion of this hosting an online meeting is taking a stop for each of those goals and then showing how that could be done during COVID. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Lisa for a few more details on the pre-work for an effective um, local work group or locally led meeting. Sure. Thank you, Donna Wright. And I'm going to go over this very quickly. Again, this is from the NRCS bulletin. So, uh, so it's probably known to those of you for whom this is very well, uh, very experienced. But for those who are newer or looking for that refresher, um, figuring out who that chairperson and the note keeper are, we're going to be doing that supervisor training next week. So, uh, so for those of you who are working with your, uh, your SWCD board, that'll, that'll be one of those you wanna check in on. Um, creating those media announcements, we are supplying some of that in, or we supplied some of that in the bonus packet that, you sent out, that we sent out with your uh, notes for the week. Getting that broad-based group. Thank you, Molly, for prompting that even a little more tangibly and uh, reframing my thinking about dating. Um, and then planning those meeting logistics. Um, we wanna go, and as you know, that local work group meeting can be one or more standalone meetings. You don't have to have just a one-time deal. Sometimes that date doesn't work for people or something like that. So, uh, so you can do it in a variety of ways, which are things that we've heard from various folks over time. Um, so with those logistics, we wanted to just briefly, because we're talking in, in some ways about the online meeting very specifically, given the circumstances that you're in right now, um, so looking at those meeting logistics online, face-to-face, -face. if you're doing a pre-survey, you'll wanna look at the possibilities of those survey platforms. SurveyMonkey is very common. I know a lot of folks have them. Um, the university, we use Qualtrics, but you know, variety of things. Donna Ray, I think Nate mentioned Poll Everywhere. We won't get into that 
but uh, we shared the link last week in the follow-up email about that. Um, they have some free access, but it also costs a chunk of money um, if you wanna have a larger group participate. So that's maybe worth checking into. Um, and then there may be other services or ways that you do poll uh, surveys. You know, of course there's always paper and then you enter it in the office if people bring those back in kind of thing um, and creating those survey questions and distributing. And then if you're going online, as you've experienced with us, that's really been one of our goals is to really share an experience here that you have and then you don't realize, oh, that's how that worked. Um, so if it's online, you're gonna use some kind of visual slides or PowerPoint, we've seen that. And then looking at those interactive methods, much like we've done and we will do here with using Jamboard, online polls, um, even just as simple as screen sharing um, can be a way to, uh, to share things and have people participate. So with that then, um, I'll pass back to Donna Ray. So if Corey Walker gave us the um, hint to remember to customize by your county by land use. So we're still in pre-work, but for that first goal about resource concerns. And so you're trying to figure out what is not applicable to the different land sources and also what is high priority? So next slide. So if you recall, this was the example where before you were, go into a local work group, you have lows, mediums, and highs. And so one of the questions would be, how can the NRCS and your SWCD or your partner staff, your really informed staff, take this and make this work? So that's what we wanna demo here in a minute. So the use of this, is to modify what resource categories and concerns you move forward with. And so with that, we are going to practice um, in order to get to this as an end product. So- All right. And the way we're gonna do that is to do that annotation process. So I wanted to just review the instructions. You won't actually annotate this slide. You're gonna do a different one, but you'll notice uh, you wanna, hover over the, the, uh, the menu that you have and find that annotation tool. You see that circled up there. And then I'm gonna invite you as we have before to use, um, to use a, uh, a stamp. You see that on the screen there. Gotta just keep. And I want you to pick, if you can, go ahead and pick a star stamp. Um, don't put anything on just yet, but uh, We'll move to our next slide because what we want, whoops, sorry, went too far. What we want you to do is use that star stamp and just as you think about it, um, note the resource concerns where you would say that each, on each of these, I think there are 17 lines. We're using farmstead, not all four land use categories, but in a farmstead, um, use that annotation and mark which ones, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. Um, Mark, which ones you think are of highest concern? So as you look at your screen, you're seeing those stars fill right in. And names too, I can see you all jumping in there. That's very cool. There we go. So you see, you can use different, you can use a star, you can use a check mark. And really the result is that you're seeing preferences live. Simple, direct, and a chance to see things. And you can save this data if you want, which you would probably want to do. Sometimes one of my workarounds, because sometimes I don't get to share very quickly, you're seeing me pull my camera up, right? And I am taking a picture. So if I wanted to have that data for later, I would have it. You can also save it too. The annotation does have a save function. Um, so you can do that within Zoom. You may have a different, uh, different tool that you use, but you wanna explore those tools. We're using the ones that we have handy and that we know are widely used as well. Love seeing those hearts up there as well. Great, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to stop annotating now. So you get an experience, right? And this is something for those of you who are newer to hosting or those of you who are experienced, if you haven't used annotation before, this might be an opportunity. With that then, I'm gonna clear the drawings. 
Oh, as go ahead, Donna. Um, as we look at that, it looks like of low priority is probably air quality emissions, only one landed there. Weather resilience appears also to be. But where we've got lots of stars would be your high priority groups. So you can see doing this with staff, how you then get it to your next um, final example. So next slide, Lisa. Oh, okay, let me just clear the drawings. Otherwise we'll have stars, hearts and check marks. All right, there we go. So this could be a pre-meeting by Zoom or Teams and um, or Zoom and able to do the annotation. So this is again, Corey's example of how you would then with your pre-work take however you use the annotation or discussion to move things into high, mediums, and low categories. Next slide. Once you have that, to identify those relevant resource concerns, you look at your highs. And so on this one, we don't have all of them, but we've got two of them. You've got your air quality emissions and your ineffective, inefficient energy use. And from that, those are like drop down menus to resource concerns. So we'll see those. And these would be the topics that you definitely would want to bring then into your local work group. Your mediums, that would be terrestrial habitat with farmsteads, that's a judgment call for you. But the ones that are high, where it had a lot of the input as a high priority, you definitely would want to bring as resource concerns into your session. Okay, next slide. So we have two online meeting practices. So we're done with pre-work. We know our reduced set of resource concerns. We've got our meeting logistics and our methods all set up. And so now you have to think about how do you reach this goal? And so we had Justin Hansen tell us about storytelling. Next slide. And if you recall, this is Justin, thank you, Justin, about listening to people and humans tell their story and then having um, someone be able to interpret it into the natural resource concerns. And so next slide. So that's the advice, listen and figure out the resource concerns. So the, the pre-COVID looked like this, that's Justin's slide, a person, a lot of people in the room, some cool caps and probably some snacks, maybe even a meal, but how would it look now during COVID? So one possibility would be you're moving it online. And if you have a small group, perhaps a staff member who has set that up in advance, and as they listen to the stories, they use the Jamboard to note those resource concerns from the stories. And then just like the flip chart would be, you bring it forward so people see, oh yes, that is what we've been talking about here in Mauer County. Then if you have a large group, which we hope you do, um, and if they have um, ability to um, go in and do it online, you start with the breakouts, but then maybe you have a staff member in each of those breakout sessions to record just like you would have in the large group. And then you share that with the group and then probably find some commonalities amongst the groups. So thank you, Justin, for getting us started on thinking about the storytelling, the listening method, the open discussion. Next slide. Then Nate, if you recall, brought us some great photos and talked about the importance of introducing the land uses and also showing some of the resource concerns by photos. So how might you do this in, um, as you do the pre and post COVID time? So here's an example of that. Nate said, you know, give each small group Again, we imagine them sitting in a room, but give them 50 points for land use. And then you assign those points for each of the, um, of the order and give them some, some time to complete that. And so with that, um, one of the ideas is you have to be sure to tell them what the resource concerns are, and they may have the, the manual in the back. But now I'm going to pass it to Lisa to share about how this could be done online. Sure. Well, of course, we have the pre-COVID experience with folks in online. In a COVID situation, if you're going to do this, many of you, I'm sure, have experience using spreadsheets. Um, there's also online within Google, G Google spreadsheets or G sheets, as I call them. So step one would be to actually create that sheet 
with your your uh, concerns, right? Or your uh, your resource concerns. And you see that here. We uh, we did a sample for you, so you see some sample groups here. Um, and those lists, and they're set up so that you can actually put numbers in those 50 points. You could have your small groups do them or have your staff person uh, pay attention and record. Then you've got the, uh, the step two is getting those numbers in. You get that total. Um, so you've got that example, much like we just did with the stars, but a little bit differently here. Um, and then in our third iteration, you can sort them into the highest concerns. So you get that list, you use that spreadsheet in a way that you can show if, if people are not accessing the spreadsheet, and that's fine. You don't have to have participants do it. You can have it done as a staff thing. You can have them work in small groups, come back, report, and live show them how this works so that they have the experience of seeing it and you are sharing your expertise as they are sharing theirs. So any additional comments there, Donna Ray? No, and I think too, just like we had the medium when you were looking at resource concerns, you might have five, you might have 10, you get to make your judgment call about how many farmstead resource concerns you would like to rank. All right. And so we're now you. moving on to goal two, which is your um, opening for your participants to give their comments about the federal, state, and local programs, anything conservation oriented, and then in addition, farm bill programs, because those are um, important to see. So there's define your buckets, Nate said, and so this was his slide to say these might be the type of things that you would um, ask for comment on. So uh, he recommended it in before COVID was really this bucket list grab a packet of sticky notes, put a sticky note up on the wall around those, those federal programs. However, in the during COVID, you could also bring in a Jamboard and you could have three sheets preset with your program titles or your um, other types of things that might you know be very uh, like easements or whatever else would be relevant to your area. And you could ask people then to um, share their ideas for those and collect those ideas. And then those go and get sent um, into the workbook. And with that, we have one more example in this section um, of meeting the goals in local work groups. And I'll pass to Lisa. Yeah, and I'll just build on your idea, Donna Ray. If folks are finding that uh, the participants aren't comfortable with Jamboard or, or you as staff don't have Jamboard per se, you could always use a Word doc and ask people to put things in the chat if you have a larger group, as we've done here, um, or if you have a smaller group, you can just have them unmute and then show them on the screen. So you can use a variety of ways um, that help people to see as they're experiencing in an online environment. And so thanks, we'll move to that last one, the goal three, um, the technical and non-programmatic recommendations. Um, as you see, we have the before COVID time where we had conversation recorded in the local working group minutes and snacks provided. And then of course, during COVID, we've got conversation recorded in the local working group in minutes, but you have to bring your own snacks, which is kind of how this works, right? We've been taking care of ourselves even more and probably our families and other folks around us as well. So um, with that then, Don Ray, back to you. Yes, so we're nearing the, bringing the full circle together. So we're back now to that record that you have based on all these great inputs. And so you can imagine that from each of the um, areas in the state, GO, um, the data collection worksheet book is completed by the NRCS staff and then it gets compiled. And so there's lots of data flying into the state, but then in addition, next slide, you decide and Darren Newell coach dust, be sure to include the NRCS language for your local one watershed, one plan if you're doing that or other local planning. And he shows that with the natural resource concern category. These would be how it got embedded so that SWCD and NRCS um, might have an action plan and they can use that locally. And then back to the state after 
Keith receives all of this. He showed us earlier in this series about how they take all those rankings and the conversations you've had and in, in order then to set what are the resource concern priorities identified. So these are from your last round and what we're looking now and giving guidance on or coaching is for your 2022 for those local work groups. So there we have it. We run that circle, tried to bring it full circle and recapped a lot of the great information brought by earlier speakers and hoping it um, is gelling for you in regard to how to customize your local resource. So with that, I'm gonna to pass to Leanne Buck and um, we are moving into a new section called Better Together, putting the, um, the things. So Leanne. Sure, thank you, Donna Ray, and thank you, Lisa. As we segue, uh, when I was asked to talk about Better Together, the SWCDs and NRCS, I was starting to think about, well, you know, I happened to look up from my computer and sitting on the table across in my home office here was the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So I was just wondering if any of you remember that book, um, could you guys type in the chat? Do you guys remember, do you have a favorite habit out of those seven habits? Go ahead and type if you happen to remember it. And if not, um, I encourage you, if you ever have a chance or just some time to catch up on things, which I know it's hard for us right now, but uh, you might wanna take a look at that book because there's a lot of good foundational keys. So when I was thinking of habit number four, I was thinking win-win. And obviously I do, I have to think a lot about that, especially working at the state level with policy and the legislature, different things. But I think it's also applicable in any arena. So to, and again, to look at the Covey book, it may be a little old fashioned, but for me, the message in the books are foundational. And so when I picked up my worn out copy, I was sitting there at the table of contents just to remind me of the other six habits, because again, I tend to be focused a little bit on the win-win component. And at that moment, without realizing it earlier, the messages of what Covey has proclaimed as the public victory is what we've been communicating in this locally led effort and this training series. And so just to remind you, or for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, Covey identified the three habit or the seven habits in basically three categories. There's a private victory, a public victory and renewal. And for what I'm gonna zero in in is the public victory. And that includes habit number four, think win-win. And you've heard that statement over and over. But the habit number five is seek first to understand and then be understood. I keep going back to what Darren Uval had talked about at that first session and Justin about how to listen uh, how to use that language. Uh, Darren did an excellent job of trying to you know, look at what was articulated in the One Watershed, One Plan, and then how can that be understood via the local working group process and using that same language. I think it goes back to, I had a conversation with the district manager after one of the training sessions, and they said to me, you know, Leanne, it's on us as soil and water districts, because maybe our NRCS partners aren't that heavily involved in One Watershed, One Plan. So it is up for us to think about how do we interpret the information in one meeting and translate it so it means. So I encourage you to look at, Darren Newville has that excellent handout. And again, Donna Ray referenced it earlier. The other piece in the last one is Synergy. And so you guys know these, these are kind of fundamental things. It's not rocket science, but then I go back to mission, meaning and purpose and I continue to think about our SWCD and NRC history. And for me, at times I think of SWCDs and NRCS, we have the same DNA. And what I mean by that is our roots are best in implementing federal, state, and local conservation programs while recognizing the local autonomy. So how does a federal system ingratiate its way into the local community? The attorneys that drafted the SWCD statute said SWC citizen boards. So basically what they were thinking about was a public victory over 75 years ago. So again, what's new is old again. So again, as I think about our SWCD and NRCS public uh, victories, I'm probably telling you nothing that you don't know, but sometimes I think it's, it's worth stating the obvious. For the SWCDs at times, we do benefit from the technology and the research that has been accumulated and created by NRCS across the country. Because of our unique partnership, I mean, DNR isn't co-located or Bowser isn't co-located, it's Southern Water District co-located with that federal partner in 70 out of our 88 offices. Because of that unique partnership, we have access to surveys, soil surveys, practice standards, tools. 
And so big deal, we might take it for granted, the stuff that happens behind the curtain, but what I really wanna emphasize is that stuff behind the curtain is probably millions of dollars of research data from universities across the country. And it's stuff that stormwater districts wouldn't have access to on our own. I don't even think the state could create some of that. So again, um, whether it's the field office technical guide, again, scientific references, technical engineering standards, again, those are all part of what the federal system and the things maybe we take for granted. Uh, sometimes I think we take for granted when I drive to work, I'm on a public road or a public highway. Somebody had to spend the time, the money and the energy to design that and it also include then and modify it so it increases the safety, has, uh, safety components. So I look at this as an ongoing continuation of how we're enhancing our tools. For NRCS, having a local partner that can make local decisions, access state and local programs, and what I would say may have greater flexibility with the community for outreach and efforts is a win-win. And then one of the other areas that I just, this is small, and again, we might take it for granted, but SWCDs, we have an annual award, a majority of the districts participate in this, and they recognize their outstanding conservationists. And I've sat through many a banquet, and I'm always impressed when they're listing the achievements of those um, those landowners achieve conservation results by utilizing both the state and federal programs. And also, I'm not just going to say the programs, but that person, the boots on the ground, whether it's a, fate or a local SWCD or an NRCS employee. So what I'm saying at the end of the day is, but before that SWCD, there is peer recognition and testimonials that gets out in the community, and they are going to be key to garnering the public support for both NRCS and SWCD programs. That is a component of civic engagement. So again, there's other examples and I won't go into it, but what I want you to think about now, I know at times we wonder, uh, does the citizen input for the one watershed, one plan, for example, change our outcomes for the plan? As districts, we go through this effort, does it make a difference? Does the local working group make a difference? Um, just recently, uh, we had our state board meeting and we had the assistant soil conservationist from NRCS and in their strategic plan for soil health, talked about the local working groups. I'm in meetings all the time with Troy Daniels. He's advocating whether he's talking to corn growers or soil and water districts, the local working group. He's going back to what was in the local working group. So at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat it. I know this work is hard. I know we're busy with our own personal work. We've got deadlines. We've got agency requirements. We've got emails. We've got outcomes. But again, I get it. So what I wanna say is I'd like you to take a moment and if you can, just to think about a conservation milestone. Either it's your district's milestone, your personal one as a technician or a district manager or a soil, uh, the DC. But I wanna ask you, and if you want to, feel free to share, but what is a personal milestone that your district has completed or achieved or your NRCS field office has achieved in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years? What would be a milestone? So then the next question I'm gonna ask, as you think about that milestone, how much of those achievements or outcomes also included the help of another individual or organization? So again, part of it is, you know, my old analogy, and don't tell my math teacher, but um, again, the collective effort of private lands conservation, for me, one plus one equals eight we're greater than the sum of our parts. So again, thank you. And what I'm gonna do is just segue over to, uh, recently we had a few of you were possibly on that phone call. We invited Sarah Groundfield with the Traverse SWCD and four or five other SWCDs on a recent soil health discussion. So when we were thinking about putting this program together, I thought, you know what, Sarah's got a great, great perspective, a great communication style. And I thought, what a wonderful way to share what both the Traverse SWCD and their NRCS offices are doing. So with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah. And Sarah, before you start, I just want to ask you, what can you share that you enjoy about spring? So thank thank you. you guys so much. Um, I'm going to hold up a picture, if you guys can see. This is one of my most favorite things about spring, <laughs> fresh asparagus. And I go hunting around our farm, our rural area. This is a few years ago, but our daughter helped us um, can pickled asparagus, and that is absolutely my most favorite thing about spring. 
So yeah, my name is Sarah Groenfeld. I'm the district manager here at the Traverse SWCD in Wheaton. And today actually marks a special anniversary for myself. It's been 18 years in the conservation field here in Wheaton. And so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, looking back to some of our historical uh, um, things that we've done, I actually started my career in Lacquaparo County um, right after college and Burton Hendrickson had done some training for me. I think he's still with the district, but um, getting a start out with conservation and training from Bert was a great experience for me. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight our USDA Service Center, SWCD and NRCS. We are united for you. This was our fair booth back a few years, but we felt it was important to uh, convey that to our community, that we are united to serve them. We're definitely better together. Um, we've been co-located here together for decades but back in 2011, we did some lease negotiation and being co-located was of utmost importance for us. Um, it led to some changes and we actually decided to pursue purchasing our service center here. And now we lease space to USDA. So it, it really works out well um, and the transition has been very smooth. Next slide, please. So flashback to 2005, this was our old service center location, which was actually in the Wheaton High School back in the West Wing. We had a very tiny office, but you know what? We took the opportunity. We not only worked hard as a team to deliver conservation to our partners, but we all chipped in for a potluck right before Christmas. And you can see in the picture I wanted to share We've got Keith Klobeck and John Free, who were both NRCS staff at the time, and Bruce Johnson there. And uh, Luke Johnson still works for Conservation District and Jackie Schmitz. But it was important for us as staff to work together and we work hard to build and maintain trust, not only between our landowners, but between staff. So this is a good memory of um, uh, a different time, but uh, a fun thing to look back to. Next slide, please. Another fun picture, uh, not so fun for the erosion, but a fun picture of Keith uh, surveying a field that had some severe wind erosion in Traverse County. We still have a lot of work to do, but since that time, this is about 2005 or 2006, we haven't witnessed such extreme erosion on a single field. Um, this winter was pretty brutal with some pretty strong winds and some wind erosion, but overall, you know, I think we're definitely making progress and have seen some great results through time. Next slide, please. This is a picture from back in 2013 where we worked together with NRCS to meet with landowners in the Boyd Sioux Watershed District to discuss some possible project options to fix some severe bank erosion along County Ditch 52. You can see in the background how severe the erosion is along County Ditch 52. And the NRCS team uh, engineers work together to try to develop some options for our local um, watershed district and landowners to pursue. It didn't end up working out, but you know what? That partnership was really important and we still are thankful for the efforts that NRCS had dedicated to project ideas for this project. Next slide, please. This is looking at a project just about a mile upstream from Lake Traverse. So Lake Traverse is the headwaters of the Red River. And we had a landowner stop in who had expressed some concerns with some severe gully erosion. It was really hard to get a picture beforehand because the area was so heavily forested along the gully. But this is a picture during construction and you can see the size of the equipment out there. It was a very um, severe project, severe erosion. 
that the NRCS provided some technical assistance with engineering and services and also funding. And the SWCD had applied for a clean water fund grant and worked with the landowner and agencies to um, work through that project. And it was a success. Next slide. Here is the after picture. So you can see how long the project was um, funding wise. NRCS contributed about 25,000 and our clean water funds just over 50. Um, the resource concern was completely resolved in this case and there was a drop structure installed the landowner was very satisfied with the results and I think it looks great. It's been almost 10 years back in 2012 and it's holding up just beautifully. Um, certainly a, an asset to the water quality of Lake Traverse and the Red River. And last slide, please. Nope, a little too far, back up just one. Thank you. So I just wanted to end with this, behold the future. My thought is we've really experienced a lot of changes with, part, with our partners, changes in leadership, staff and programs with NRCS. You know, it's only been about 15 years or so since Keith and John left our office, but we've seen many changes since that time. Um, one thing that we always think about is what can we do to foster an honest and open relationship? It's not easy. We work hard to, to work together to get the conservation on the ground for our landowners. Uh, we really appreciate working with Corey Walker and we try hard to maintain open lines of communication. As was mentioned, it's, it's a difficult time with COVID-19 and the pandemic to when folks are working remotely to keep up that line of communication, but we really work hard to maintain that and um, encourage our other districts and partners, both NRCS, USDA, FSA, all together to work together to best serve our landowners and take pride in that fact. So that's about all I have. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share some memories and some thoughts and ideas with you today. Um, it's my pleasure to join you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne and Sarah. We want to pause on this notion of the partnership for those milestone memories or for those who are new to the organizations to um, also think. So we're gonna just post the, this question also in the chat, but we would like you to each think about what's, what's one thing that I can do to foster trust and build relationships between NRCS and SWCDs because as um, both Leanne and Sarah have said, it's the public victory and things change over time. And so, and now we've had to pull together in COVID times. So um, go ahead and respond to that in the chat and um, then we will um, move to the next section. One thing to do in regard to building trust and relationships with NRCS and SWC joint outreach. I've always thought just when you have a important piece of work to do together is a great time to do it. Communicate openly. Thank you, Anita. This local working group and doing the pre-work online and, and so on will be a, a next chance. Uh, Terry Peters, share opportunities, wonderful. What's one thing that I can do to foster trust and build relationships? The SWCD board meeting, listen to each other. Transparency among staff, piggyback resources. Great. Thank you, everyone. And you can continue to offer those. Keep the doors open. Keep offering opportunities. We're now at the time where we are going into our breakout conversations. And so communicate, thank you, good communicate. I think that's a key theme. So you see today the breakout questions are, 
what ideas do you have overall um, in terms of closing the loop here on the training series? What ideas are you bringing forth to enhance your locally led conversation, conservation work, and what would be your next best step or steps that you're going to take with locally led goals or actions? So as we've done before, when you return, we would like your group reporter to share two or three of your group's ideas um, with, with the Jamboard. And if you've had that chance to try it before and someone else has not yet had that chance, it'd be a great time to do that. So a reminder, as you go to the breakouts, unmute yourself, someone just start the conversation. When the one minute warning appears, just keep talking and we will see you back in um, a few minutes. And as we get ready to go to those rooms, I'm uh posting those questions to the chat, Donna Ray, as a reminder, so folks will want to open that chat. I also will let you know, we've mentioned it before, but if, uh, if you end up being in a breakout room by yourself, a person can't join for whatever reason, they got a call and they got to deal with it, um, we, I will move you into another room so that you can have a conversation with others. So thank you for that. Welcome back as you're coming from your small groups. Welcome back. So welcome back as you come back from your small groups. Um, we're gonna encourage you, the, the, we hope that that was good conversation and uh, I'm gonna post a link in the chat for those reporters or if you were two people, uh, one of you, I know some groups were small and not everybody joined in. That's okay. We know things come up, but we do know that activity and engagement uh, helps things stick. And so, uh, and you've got a lot of resource here in this group. So you'll notice uh, folks are starting to come in to the, uh, to the jam board. If you haven't been in there before and you're trying it out, kudos for, uh, for a little bit of an experiment. Again, remember that that down on the left-hand side, that sticky note is down the fourth one down and you click on that and you put one idea per sticky and then you wanna move it as our fabulous people are already. Beautiful, thank you. Beautiful. And if you wrote pre-work, narrowing it down, if you could write that on a sticky, that would be just great. Some of them we've seen before and that's okay. Part of what we're doing here is not just coming up with new stuff, but refreshing the ideas that, uh, that you may have had in the past. And you go, oh yeah, that's right. I, uh, I have taught facilitation a lot and I've had uh, participants who have been seasoned professionals tell me that, uh, that they realized how they'd forgotten or that they've gotten, uh, gotten lax in the ways that they facilitate so that they could make meetings worth attending, worth being part of. So that's a bit of what we're doing here too. We're getting new ideas. We're also refreshing. For those who are newer, they're learning things. The learning curve is real. Um, and for others, oh my goodness, this is fabulous. The way this is filling up so quickly, do feel free to move things around. Um, as you may have noticed, if you've looked at the, uh, at the materials after when we sent them out, I typically go in then and sort like ideas together. We call that affinity mapping in the universe of facilitation work. Um, and so that you get to see like ideas next to each other. And I will encourage, uh, let me just move my cursor here a little bit. Um, encourage you to keep moving those slides around to make space for more. It's nothing personal. Just so we get lots of room for lots of ideas. This is the beauty of tapping such a great talented group of people including the uh, happy anniversary Sarah experience. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's okay, it gets messy, right? That's all right. Messy is not a bad thing. Messy is just the, on our way to figuring stuff out. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna move some of these on the bottom row a little bit lower just to make a little more space. Please keep adding. And if you need to overlap, that's okay too. Some of these are have some empty space, right? We can tuck them under each other and that's all right. That's all right. Beautiful. So Donna Ray, how are we doing on time? We are doing just fine. We have um, a couple more minutes for this. If anybody wants to add or if we want to 
practice affinity mapping of these perhaps where you put the like ideas next to one another in about two minutes and then we'll um, go to the, the Mentimeter and then closing comments by Keith and Leanne. Beautiful, yeah. So um, there's so much on here. It's hard for me to, uh, to see all that there is, but I'm trying to uh, come up with some ideas for how to connect to affinity map. There we go. I see calling people, calling producers on the phone. We'll move those things next to each other. Welcoming. Yeah. Oh, meeting at a brewery. Is that someone from Stearns County? I know they have a thing about breweries in Stearns County, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's true in other places as well. There is something about hospitality that food and beverage really encourage the kind of things that we, uh, that we want to see. I don't know if I'm going to be able to affinity map. There's too much going on here. There's so many good ideas. This is great. So we will, we will get these mapped though, for sure. Well, thank you, Lisa, very much for that. And yeah. um, any closing tips for us? Um, I would just remind folks, if you are going to use Jamboard, um, you're certainly going to want to practice and you can. One thing I've really learned, and I'll just quickly highlight it, I think you can see on my screen, um, the sharing with people. I have learned that you really need to make sure if you want to have people other than you work on it, you need it. Mine defaults to people, only the people I've specifically shared with. So I click on the anyone with the link and you yeah. want to pay attention. If you just want them to see it, that's okay. You know, you're going to figure that out what works for you. But if you want them to add like you guys have, you're going to want to make them an editor. So when you share that link, you just want to make sure about that. Now, you'll probably mess up it's, like I have more than once, um, but that's okay. It's, it's practice. And so I mentioned that because I've learned from yeah. practice too. All right. So, so just that, to thank yeah. you, Lisa. Just a reminder yeah, to mute down. yourself in the large group. Um, we're getting a little interference, but we um, thank you very much. So we have one more Mentimeter that we would like you to participate in. And as we move into closing here, the question is, what's something that you valued from this training? Our wish and hope would be that you were at multiple trainings. However, if today's your first one, we hope too that it was value added for you. So in the chat, we're going to put the link and then we invite you to follow that link in to respond to what's something that you value um, from this training series. People can be jotting something down and then be ready to go. Donna Ray, this is Nicole. I don't, the last link I see is for our group that we met. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Takes a while on the internet highway, I bet, to get up there, ah, Nicole, but there it comes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for unmuting and asking. Sometimes the, the power of a good question really moves things along. Thank you, Nicole. And again, the instruction is to click on the link and we'll get to see many of your comments. And do feel free to be specific. Um, you know, we're using this, this Mentimeter as a tool to highlight a few things. I find that having short answer kind of questions, so something you valued, you're seeing two or three words or four. Um, we did it on the opening as well, where you get a chance to really get a quick take. Now you could use this as a polling tool as well, really, because your biggest, uh, your most frequent ideas are gonna show up bigger, as you see in these word clouds. Um, that doesn't mean the other things aren't good. It's just that you can use that in a, in a sort of casual way. I wouldn't necessarily use it as a serious poll, but uh, I do want to highlight that possibility as, uh, as something you can use this for as well. It's also a great way to just kind of check in with people. Um, so in your partnership between SWCD and NRCS, you may find this to be a tool that you practice with each other or use 
to refresh your gatherings or use as a way to kind of connect your staff and learn about things. Because one thing we know about, uh, about trust and relationship is that it's not just about the work, it's also about the human's being. I like to say we are human beings before we are humans doing. And so uh, it's a great way to connect people in other kinds of ways as well. Thank you. And thank you for participating in that and being part of the series. We are now at our closing with um, comments by Leanne Buck and Keith Klobeck. So um, who's going first? I can. Uh, thank you. Uh, leave Leanne to close it out, but uh, thank you speakers today and thank you uh, everyone that participated. I think session four went well. It was great to see um, some of the new tools and other things out there. So I kicked this session off talking about the why and the why now um, for this training. And I think this really helped emphasize that um, with the situation we're in and you know, likely doing remote meetings again. Uh, hopefully you found something meaningf meaningful today and from the prior weeks that you can take forward based on the latest Jamboards. A lot of great comments, so that's, that's fun to see as well. But we've given you a lot of tips and, and other things over the last three weeks and the resources, these recordings will be posted. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed right now, that's okay. It's been a lot of information, a lot of resources, a lot of new things to some of you. Um, but you know, those resources are out there, the handouts, so if we can reference back to them in the upcoming weeks as you plan this year's locally led series and local work group meetings. But, you know, I, some of the things that I really liked seeing were, um, you know, the ideas on giving people money when they walk in the door, or maybe you came up with the idea of polls and jam boards, you know, showing photos, the, the flashback of Sarah, showing me standing there getting pelted, squinting, <laughs> you know, and sinking into knee high, you know, silt that's blown off the field from nearby um, wind erosion is really, you know, the photos and the message that some of our earlier presenters talked about is showing what a resource concern is, you know, what wind erosion in Traverse County can look like many years ago. And I'm glad to hear that it hasn't happened like that much since. So I think those are some of the things that we just, we do it every day. We take it for granted. You know, I forgot about that situation, but um, you know, having that picture um, really brought it home and I think can drive home some of the resource concerns and needs that maybe not everyone has experienced in your county. So, you know, as the saying goes, you really get out of it what you put into it. And that is definitely true over locally led and local working groups. And so my challenge to all of you is to challenge each other for this upcoming year. You know, SWCDs, don't take a backseat to NRCS and just let them have two or three of you sitting around the conference room, checking some boxes on resource concerns. NRCS, the same thing, you know, challenge SWCDs. You've got the tools, you've got the resources, um, you've got the knowledge, you've got other, other counties, other SWCD staff, NRCS staff that have experience in this that have offered up their expertise and our resources for you. So in a nice friendly way, of course, challenge each other, make your local work group better this year, try to find that meaningful, impactful way, and then that'll just build and continue on going forward. So that's really the whole purpose of this. Um, I hope you get, feel there's some value and then some things that you're gonna change. And we appreciate your engagement with that. Uh, I will turn it over to Leanne for her closeout comments. Uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you for those comments. Uh, hey, everybody, I got my voice back. Uh, but what I do wanna say, as employees, we wanna be part of a winning team and we wanna see results. I was reminded of this when I had a board retreat. Every given year, I have nine to 10 board members that we sit down and think about what are our priorities for the next year. And I had a board member come up to me and, and say those words that people wanna be part of a winning team. And when they feel that energy, they build that momentum. So one of the things I was just thinking about to summarize, in many respects, citizens do as well. They wanna see, uh, be part of a winning team and they wanna see results. And there's that old saying, thoughts become things. So how you think about your local work groups, how you work together, how you structure your public meetings, whether it's a local work group meeting or a board meeting, uh, how you share, or in many cases, get data to info, you know, provide your outcomes. Uh, Donna Ray Sheffer reminded me of that when she was facilitating one of our board retreats and said, you know, why don't you share your milestones? 
so many times I'm busy looking forward that I don't take time to tell the board, hey, look what you collectively have done. And I think that could be done of a local work group, again, board meeting every December, the Salt Water District and NRCS staff could say, here's what we did this year. So again, how you think about your local work groups, how you work together, how you stru structure the meetings, how you share your outcomes, how you listen to stakeholders, how you articulate your priorities, and when possible, um, how do we use the same language? It's going to say a lot about our collective work together and the work we do with the public. So again, I just want to thank you so much for what you're already doing. This was intended to enhance what you're already doing. And so we appreciate the work out there. And I want to also say a big thank you to the NRCS for this opportunity, as well as Donna Ray Shepherd with Leadership Tools and Lisa Hines with the University of Minnesota Extension. And most importantly, thank you again to all of you for participating over this month in the series of webinars that we've been providing for you. Thank you.